Well, good morning. It's been a while, but I really appreciate being able to to take over for Jim for this Sunday, and it really is an awesome, awesome privilege to be able to share with you from God's Word. Some of the things that we just now sang about is what we're going to be talking about this morning, and it seems to me that it's already been said but for some reason, the Lord wants us to, to look at it again. And that is what we're talking about, the, the being justified by faith in Christ Jesus. So let's, let's start this morning. Let's, let's read Galatians 2, starting with verse 14 and down to verse 21. Galatians 2, 14. And let's, let me say this before we read. Uh, A lot of what we're going to hear this morning is things that we heard a couple weeks ago when Jim was preaching. But you know, like I said, for some reason the Lord wants us to review this. And in my own heart, that's what I've been doing is reviewing it over and over. So let's look here at Galatians chapter 2, verse 14, starting with 14 and down through 21. He says, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, who Paul is talking about is is, uh, Peter and, and Barnabas and some of the others. When I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, or Peter, in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? We who are Jews by, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we also ourselves have been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, that I might live unto Christ." I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Well, let's let's just have a word of prayer before we go any further. Lord, we just thank you this morning for your texts. We thank you for what we've heard from Romans and also now from Galatians. And Lord, from the song we were singing, that you are the justifier of the sinner. Thank you so much, Lord, for this text now. We pray that you'll hear not my words, but your words coming out, and that we will glorify you in whatever we say this morning and think about. Thank you so much, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, like I said, it's been a long time since I've been up here. Uh, And we were looking at the, the book of Galatians. We've gone through some of it already. But instead of giving us a review immediately, what I'd like to do is give us like an overview of the whole book, the whole letter that Paul wrote to the Galatians this morning. And this overview is going to touch on some highlights uh, of each section of the book this morning. And it's going to help us, it's going to help put it in perspective what Paul is teaching in some of the verses we just read together, both in Romans earlier and just now. And what's important to note is that now we're coming to a central theme in the book of Galatians, and that is justification, the doctrine of justification. And this doctrine we're going to be looking at is important in understanding the whole gospel, isn't it? And this is why it's central to Paul's letter. So in a sense, it's going to be like an overview and a review as well, because we're going to touch on some of the things that I talked about last time to kind of bring you up to, to memory. So what does Paul's book cover? What does it, what is it? I broke it down into four sections, and let's just, just, in brief, I want to give you the sections and just give you a summary before we get into actually Galatians uh, 2.15 here. Galatians 1, 1 through 10 is called the introduction. The introduction and the Paul's purpose statement. And in this section, Paul has been telling the churches who he is and why he's writing them. And he very boldly comes out here and he, he talks a lot differently in this letter than he does in the Philippians or Romans or some of the others because he just right, gets right to the point here. And he tells them that they, the, the teachers who have been coming from Jerusalem, the Jewish teachers, 
they're false teachers and they've been distorting the gospel and he tells them that it was twisted into a false gospel. And then we get a, an indication of Paul's agitation because we read in Galatians 1, 7, and 8 where he says this to the Galatian believers. He says, I am amazed, he says, that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So, so Paul's letter here was, in this section, was very personal, wasn't it? It was very personal, telling them right to their faces. And it was to wake them up, to get them to look and to see what was going on. And you know what, this is, this is for us too, because we also need to remember at all times that we also are prone to seek, to seek God's approval sometimes by things that we do ourselves, whether it's by praying or by going to church or by singing. We often try to think we're, we're getting God's approval, and that's what Paul was talking about. We cannot do anything to gain God's approval. And so that was section one, verses one through 10. Then section two starts in verse 11 and it goes to 214. And this is what I labeled as Paul's authority and his defense of his apostleship. And then in my last two messages, we covered this uh, last section. And in summarizing it, I would like to say that Paul was very effective in proving that he was appointed by Jesus Christ and he was given Jesus Christ's message. It came from Jesus. And we saw also in this section how uh, Paul used an experience for an illustration for the Galatian Christians. And his experience was when he confronted Peter in Antioch for his hypocrisy. Peter had been afraid of what his Jewish friends were thinking about him, and so he had pulled back from the assembling with the Gentiles. In other words, he was saying that he was better than the Gentiles, but he was also trying to teach the unity of Christ at the same time, so it was hypocrisy. So he was basically communicating the same message that the false teachers were giving, that a man had to conform to Mosaic laws as well as believe. So we got conforming or works and faith together, works and believing. So Paul was dabbling in what we would call a false religion because all religions are basically the same thing. They make us think we can work our way to heaven or work ourselves into God's approval. So the, this is where we came to at the end of this section last time, and that was from 111 to 214. The next section, Galatians 215, to f- all the way to the end of the chapter four, 431, and this is Paul's defense of the doctrine of justification through faith. This is the one, that, this is the heart of his letter, okay, that he wrote, the most important section, and this is almost all doctrine, but it has some illustrations. It, Paul illustrates this doctrine by uh, telling us how the Mosaic law was a tutor for a time to put people under it for a time. And he also gives the story of Abraham's faith and the comparison of Abraham's two wives, Sarah and Hagar, and the differences that they represented between slavery and freedom, which also is the law and grace. Each of these illustrations show how a believer can only be justified through faith. Here in this section, he defines what justification means and logically gives proof, and he uses a number of questions in it, and I'd like to go through that whole section, but it's way too long, so we're only going to do just a tiny bit of it this morning. This is where we're going to come back to in a minute. The next section is Paul's practical applications, and it goes from Galatians 5.1 all the way through to 6.10. And just a summary, he outlines what it means for a believer to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And he makes a call to stand fast in the liberty that we have in Christ. He also contrasts the difference between someone who's living in the flesh, which would be a believer, an unbeliever, and who's living by the Spirit, which would be a believer. And it's also about applying practically what he taught from these from these previous sections, from the section, the doctrinal section. I like applications, so that's why I'd like to get through this whole thing, but like I say, we're only gonna do a couple of verses. Galatians 5, 1 to 6, 10 is Paul's, excuse me, that was his, that was his application. Galatians 6, 11 through 18 is his autographed conclusion. Here, he wanted the believers to understand that he had written this letter with his own hand, and we don't see that very often. In fact, we don't see it. It's usually somebody else, like Timothy, has written the letter for him. And so this is Paul saying, I wrote this with my own hand. 
He also makes the point that he could only glory in the cross. Well, those who wanted to add circumcision and following the laws were glorying, glorying in their flesh, in their own accomplishments. So it was pride. So even this conclusion of Paul's letter is still about maintaining a pure gospel. All right, so that's, that's just a brief overview of the whole book. So now we're going to come back to Galatians 2, 15, that starts the section, and all it is, is all we're going to look at this morning is an introduction. Paul's defense of the doctrine of the justification through faith. We're going to look at some other related scriptures, quite a few, in fact. So let's just go as quickly as we can here. I have to keep my eye on the clock because I think this is way more than we'll ever cover today. Okay, so hang in there. All right, 2.15. It says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. So, okay, who was, who was he saying when he says we? We. He obviously would, would be including himself and he would be including Peter because he's still talking to Peter here and he's including Barnabas and those other Jews who had been separating themselves Hypo, uh, being high, high, hypocritical in their actions. They're in Antioch. <clears throat> so that's the we. And he says, we are Jews by nature. What did he mean by this? What he was saying was that these men that he's talking about, himself and Peter and Barnabas and the others, they hadn't become Jews later. They weren't proselytes. They were, they were Jews by birth, and they were also Jews by the fact that they had followed all their lives, all the regulations, all the ceremonies before they had become believers. They had followed the traditions. They had been taught to observe everything. So this is what I believe he said by, we are Jews by nature. But then he adds this very interesting next phrase here. And, and I had to puzzle over this one for a while. He says, and not sinners from among the Gentiles, okay? It's such an interesting phrase, it's almost in our modern times, it could sound a little bit prejudiced, wouldn't it? As he's calling himself a Jew and those guys sinners. So what did he really, what was he saying here? Why was he saying this? Well, I don't believe it was being prejudiced or anything. I think he was reminding Peter again, okay? That even though they were a part of God's original choice as the Jewish nation to be God's representatives of himself and the rest of the world, that was a little bit, that's a tiny bit of the distinction. He was calling them sinners to convey that the Gentiles had some real disadvantages. Okay, they were, they were sinners, but we're all sinners, aren't we? But they, they were not, they didn't have the advantages of going through the law and going through the promises of, of what the Jews had been through. They hadn't known what it was like to keep the law. They hadn't realized that a man can never be saved by his own efforts. They hadn't heard any of this. Whereas the Jew had heard that. The laws were pointing them to what? They were pointing them to the Messiah. It was actually saying, you can't do this. But the, the Gentile had never heard this before. They'd come out of this darkened life without the restraint of the laws. They'd been notorious sinners and pagans and idolaters. And I think that's why Paul was contrasting the Jew with the Gentile. So by going through this description, he was just leading them up then to the next verse, verse 16. So we're going to look at this. Look with me at Galatians 2.16. He says, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in him so that we may be justified by faith. And he's referring to we, again, the Jews. We may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Another version says it this way, yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may, may be made right with God because of our faith in Christ. Not because we have obeyed the law, for no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. Now, you'll notice that Paul has started this with nevertheless. Now, I was a little bit surprised to find that there's no Greek word here. It just, it could be yet, or nevertheless, or just and. Because it's, it's not really, it's just leading in to the next section. Uh, a simplified paraphrase of both 15 and 16, I kind of worked this out and this is what I would say. And we, as Jews, 
because of our rich heritage, should know that, or we should understand that a man is not justified by the works of the law. That's all he's saying. We should know that. Or since we who are Jews know that no one is justified by any works of the law. Now remember, we gotta remember where the context here. Peter's made an error. And Paul is, is using this as an illustration for the Galatian believers to realize that this error that Peter made was that they were still trying to say there was a basis for legalism. By their action, they were showing, they were separating themselves from the Gentiles. They were being hypocritical. They were teaching grace and teaching unity among the believers there in Antioch. But they were implying by their actions that the Jews were still more blessed by God. And more importantly, they were implying that a man is justified in part by keeping the law. And that's where Paul is hitting on it. They had promoted a, a gospel, a false gospel of works plus grace. And so this is why I think that Paul's statement here when he says, yet we know, we know, was almost a bit sarcastic to, because he was saying, we already know this, guys. Come on here, we know it. And Peter should have known it because of God had revealed it to him even there in uh, Acts 10 with his encounter with Cornelius. So Peter should have known it, and that's why Paul is saying, and yet we know. All right, now, as we move down the verse, we come to the, the part that's really, I think, is most important, and it's that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, he says here in the this, this this second part of verse 15. So I have four questions that I'd like to ask. Four questions. What does Paul mean by the word justified? And we sang about it. Do we really understand it? And I had to go back and think, okay, what does it mean to be justified? Now I'll turn to where Jim read earlier this morning. Romans 3. And verses 21 and 22. Where he says, but now... Romans 3, 21 and 22. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. So the passage here in Romans is a little bit similar, isn't it? But there's some differences. There are some differences. Paul wrote in Galatians that a man is justified through faith in Christ. But here in Romans, he wrote that the righteousness of God is through faith in Christ. So we got two different sections here. Are they different? Not really. Not really. Because in Galatians, Paul is saying that God justifies the sinner. And the word justified here in Galatians comes from, I, I'm not going to pronounce this right, but it, the Greek word here, this word justified is dikaio. Okay, dikaio. The Greek verb means rendered or declared righteous. So in other words, when we say that a man is justified, we're also saying that he's been declared righteous. But then when we look at Romans 3 here, which is, if it's still open there, it says that we're talking about the righteousness of God. The word righteousness comes from the Greek noun. Okay, not the verb, but the noun. And the word is dikaio, dikaiosune. So in, in uh, Galatians, it's dikaio. In Romans, it's dikaiosune. Well, what's the difference? One's a verb, the other's a noun. Okay, I like grammar. I guess you'll probably figure that out. <laughs> the word in Galatians is a verb, and the word in Romans is a noun. But we're both talking about the same root word, the same root word. And so when it says in either one of them, being declared righteous, it also means, uh, in Romans it says declared righteous, in Galatians it says justified. Then if we drop down in, in verse 24 here, in the same passage here in Romans, look at verse 24, it says being justified, whoops, it wasn't, it's actually the same idea, it's the same word, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So Paul uses the same Greek word that he used in Galatians here. So righteousness of God and being justified by God are the same thing. So, like I said, where have we heard some of this message before? I think, thank you, Jim. <laughs> and he's probably going to get more into it. But it's just amazing how God is bringing us back to this point again. For me, to study through this is just incredible as I read through it. 
in a sense, I said it's kind of a review of Jim's message. In Hebrews 10, 38, the author says the just man lives by faith, doesn't it? Which is what we covered. And he showed us, Jim showed us that this just person is one who has been justified or declared righteous. What he demands, he also provides and clothes us with. It's not just that we're pretending to be good. A while back, I also listened to a message that Jim preached way back, I don't know when it was, 100 years ago, in Philippians. I think it was in 2008. And I really enjoyed going through Philippians because it's one of my favorite books. But when Jim got to uh, Philippians 3.9, all right, let me read that one to you before I say anything. Philippians 3.9. You don't have to turn over there, but just listen. He says, And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Sounds pretty similar, doesn't it? We got three verses here that almost say exactly the same thing. It must have been important, right? I think it was. Uh, This righteousness is only from God. So now, the second question is, because it's from God, how do we obtain it? This justification, how do we get it? In Galatians 2.16, back to Galatians, okay, for just a second here. Galatians 2.16, I want to see first how we can't obtain it, because that was part of Paul's point. He says, There in verse 16, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. And then in Romans 3.20, it says, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. And then in Philippians 3.9, it says, not having a righteousness of my own. So in each of these, we see clearly that it cannot come from a man's conduct. It can't come from keeping the laws. As Jim mentioned a few weeks ago, we can't be justified through attending, well, maybe we can. Can we be justified by attending 10 seminar meetings on holistic living? No, we can't. What about through prayer? If we pray every day, can we be justified? No, it doesn't come from that. What about if we follow a daily Bible reading program? Well, I do that, so am I justified because I've done that? No, it doesn't come through that. Doesn't come from any of those things, does it? But being righteousness in God's sight is not because of anything we can do to earn it. And that was Paul's first point to Peter and his first point to the Galatians. It cannot come, our righteousness cannot come through ourselves. Paul was telling the Philippian believers too that he counted all his own good, the things that he did good, as what? I don't know if you remember the passage in Philippians 9, as dung, as, as rubbish, as trash, as a loss in, in contrast to gaining Christ. So we can conclude that it is impossible for us to do anything about it in order to be made right with God in God's sight. Okay, but how can we do it now? We looked at how we can't, so how can we do it? The first part of this verse 16 here in Galatians says, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but, and I love the but here in this verse, but through faith and also we read in romans 22 322 it is righteousness of god through faith and uh in philippians 3 9 and he found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law but that which is through faith we got a channel here that's what that means this word through the english word in all three verses is translated from the greek word dia and according to the definition in Strong's Dictionary, dia means a primary, uh, it is a primary preposition, preposition, I like grammar, there you go, primary preposition denoting what? The channel of an act. And it's usually translated into English as through or on account of or because of. So the idea in all of them that faith is, the, is just the channel. It's just the channel, okay? Faith is the channel. So faith is the manner that we get the righteousness of God through. It can't come by any good work. It can't come by anything we've done or by keeping the law, as it says in each of those passages. So the focus is really on, in a sense, this channel of faith, that being declared righteous before God through faith. So that comes to question number three. What is this faith? 
What is faith? And now, I know, and you know, that probably next week, we're going to get into faith a lot, okay? Because that's what Hebrews 11 is. But I don't want to take away any of Jim's uh, ideas. I probably won't. But I, I just wanted to think of this. I found some really interesting uh, things on, online about what faith is. Would you like to hear them? <laughs> okay. Uh, apparently the whole world seems to think faith is something else. Something that, some whimsical uh, feeling or thing that we can work up within ourselves. This is one of them. It, well, to get through my problem, all I need is to have some faith. Okay? All right, that's one of them. Number two, faith is what helps me to get it, to get through illuminating the pathway in times of darkness, helping to give me strength in times of weakness. So, faith is a, is a light? I don't know about that, okay? Here's another one. So, sounds pretty good though, doesn't it? Okay, another one is faith is the pathway. Okay, to finding solutions in life. So faith is a pathway. Oh, that's pretty good, isn't it? All right, they all sound kind of like the same, don't they? Some kind of mysterious abstract thing that we need to find somehow, okay? Oh, well, I'm sure that you're convinced as, I, as much as I am that this is not what Paul was talking about, was he? And like I said, Jim's going to cover more on that. So I'll leave most of the definition to him, but I do want to mention a particular um, problem that we had while we were translating. I love to go into, uh, in fact, I wish I was there, translating some more uh, in, with the Manhui people. Maybe I'll take a second here just to mention something. Uh, I've gotten back into translation. My son is actually doing the work, but he just sent me the book of Jonah to go through and do a content check on. And so he says, Dad, you're working again. You're back in translation, and I need you so bad. So I've been able to do that, and we're going to work all the way through the Old Testament now, doing the same way. So I get to do it here while he's doing hard work down there. I just get to look at it and tell him what I think about it. So it's been fun. We just, like I said, we just finished the book of Jonah, and I'll do one more part. I get to back translate it into English for the consultant checker. So it's been fun. Anyway, when we were in Paraguay working and doing it ourselves, we had a, par a problem, okay? The, the problem was that these people speak a language that is very few abstract nouns, okay? Now, for you that don't care a thing about, a lick about grammar, you can just ignore all this, okay? But faith is an abstract noun. And what I mean by that is it's one of those nouns, one of those object things, like, like those people are thinking about faith being a, loom, a, a light or a pathway. They're kind of thinking like that because uh, they think that it's a noun, but, but the Manhui people can't say these words in their language. All they see in nouns are concrete things, you know, like wood or, or floor or, or ceiling or sky or tree or bird. That's what their nouns cover. Everything else has to be a verb. And most of their language, they're, they're called a verbal language is what it is. So they can't say, I have faith, because you can't touch it. They can't say, God credited his righteousness to me, because you can't touch righteousness. And they can't say, God's grace is good. These are all nouns, see? And so they can't say that. So we had to, we had to translate we had to do a flip-flop. We had to turn all of these nouns, so to speak, into verbs, into action words. So, for example, back in Romans 3.22 and both in Galatians 3.22 and 2.16, where it says that uh, a person can have God's righteousness through faith and where a man is justified through faith, because both of them are talking about God's imputed righteousness to us. We translated both pretty much the same. This is how we said, we said, and I'll say it first in Manhui, just to give you an idea that I really do speak Manhui. <laughs> okay? So that's Manhui. Here's what it says in English. God states or declares that a person is good because he believes in the Savior, Jesus Christ. So we took faith and turned it into a verb, is what we did. 
We do have another problem. Because with the word believe, you cannot just say believe. Guess what you got to have? An object, okay? So you got a transitional or a, a transitive verb, there again is the grammar, that has to have an object. And as I said in my example, it has to be believe in Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. So it's pretty obvious then that this answers my fourth question. In whom do we believe? Okay, there in that verse. We can't have lots, just lots of faith, lots of lights, lots of paths illuminating us, can we? It has to be faith in someone, and that is Jesus Christ. God justifies us through faith in Jesus Christ. So it's instead of being declared righteous or rendered righteous by one's works, it's because of Jesus Christ. So this is the message that Paul was speaking to Peter and to the Galatians. That God can only come, the, righteous, the justification of the righteousness of God can only come through believing in the person of Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross. It's both rejecting the idea that I can do it on my own and it's accepting the idea that Jesus Christ has done it for me. That's through faith. We can do nothing about it. And uh, again, I'll say it, we're justified, we're declared righteous only because of what Christ has done and there's nothing we can do. We have Christ's righteousness because God credited it to our account when we believe. And that's what the word imputed means. In Romans 4, 3, Paul spoke about it again. Another verse that also says basically the same thing. For it says, for the, what did the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness from Genesis 15, 6. Guess what? There's six passages in the Bible that say the very same thing. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. It must be important, huh? What do you think? So just like Abraham, God imputed or credited Christ's righteousness to every believer's account, to mine, to yours if you're a believer. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is not ours. There's nothing we can do to get it. We've been declared or credited with his righteousness. And Romans 3.24 says, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So it's, it's a gift, isn't it? We can't do anything to earn it. We can't do anything to work for it. It's a gift. Another thing on this idea of faith, and Jim, you're going to have to back me up on this. <laughs> But I just thought about this, this other thing about faith. This, this, this act of believing in Jesus Christ, it's never considered in the scriptures as a meritorious work or a good work that we can do. It isn't. It's always, because faith is always contrasted with works. You have faith or you have works. It's not, it's not faith is a work so that you can be saved. Faith is always contrasted. So again, Paul is not saying that, that uh, when Paul is saying that justification comes through faith, another way that, that I was thinking about saying this would be it is knowing for sure, and that's part of Hebrews 11, knowing for sure that we can't make ourselves acceptable before God by good works. And it's accepting the fact that everything has already been done because of Jesus Christ. So that's just why it can't be considered a meritorious act when we believe, because we aren't working or doing anything. We're simply convinced that God has done it already and that Jesus Christ, what God says about Christ is absolutely true. So in a sense, we're letting go of our own idea of works because it's already been done. It's already been done. So this makes much more sense to see faith in this way. Now, I want to close with another passage. Turn over to Matthew. Matthew 19, 16 through 26. I want to go through it really quickly because we're running out of time here. But I believe that there's a possibility that Jesus went through this passage with Paul in Arabia, okay? Not necessarily, we can only speculate that. And 
because of Jesus' own teaching. Listen to this, verses six, I'm gonna re- just read the verse and give you my thought, okay? So you don't really have to, to, to read it, just listen. This good man came up to Jesus in verse 16 of, of Matthew 19. He came up to Jesus, he was a, a ruler, he was a rich man, and he said, teacher, what good thing may I obtain, may I do, should I do, that I may obtain eternal life? What good thing should I do? He was assuming there was something that he still had to do, wasn't he? Some righteous act for God to accept him. He was thinking there was some law, some elu- elu- uh, elusive religious thing he had missed. And so Jesus answers him actually down in verse 26, finally. And he says, "With me, man, this is impossible, but we're not gonna get there until a couple minutes from now. Look at verse 17 first. What, what does Jesus say? He wants to just hint about it first. He says, why are you asking me what is good? There is only one who is good. And you know what? This should have stopped the man right in his tracks there, that rich young ruler, to ponder on the fact that he couldn't do anything really in the eyes of the only one who was truly good. But Jesus knew that he wouldn't get it yet. So he went on, he says, but if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Whoops. (laughs) I thought we couldn't do that. So why is Jesus saying this? Well, what he was really saying was, if you wish to enter into heaven, you must not break a single commandment. You must be perfect. And this lines up with what he had said in Matthew 5, 48 in in his Sermon on the Mount, where he said, you are to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And the problem is, nobody can do that, can they? None of us can do it. In Galatians 3, 11, Paul made this statement. He says, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. That word actually means obvious. So it's obvious that we can't make it on our own. But this young man hadn't gotten the point. He hadn't realized that it was obvious. It was about his doing good things. So look at verse 18 and 19. So he says, he says Jesus, he says, which one should I do? And Jesus then gives him these four, four uh, negative ones and then two good ones. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and finally, love your father, or honor your father, love your neighbors yourself. So what does the man say there in verse 20? He says, all these things I've kept. What am I still lacking? In other words, he was saying, man, I've already done all those things. I've gotta be lacking some other thing to do. You know what, it was sad because he's hearing these laws right out of the mouth of the lawgiver himself and he should have fallen on his knees, shouldn't he? And worshiped Jesus and said, I don't have a chance, I can't do it. But instead he was thinking that the laws that he had been keeping were like applauding him for doing so well. So what does Jesus do in verse 21? He puts his finger right on something, right on his idols. He says, if you wish to be complete, Go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. So what he was saying here that this man needed to let go. Let go of his idols, of possessions and let go of his meritorious works of trying to keep the laws, trying to to think he was good. And then finally Jesus gives him one final command. Come and follow me. And I believe this was Jesus' call to salvation. Come and follow me just like God had done with Abraham back in, in Genesis 12 when Abraham was told to, to go and, and to follow God. And what did Abraham do? He did, he obeyed. And he believed and he, and he acted on his faith and this believing was what? It was credited to him as righteousness as it states in Romans 4 and five other places. So as here, it says here in verse 22 then, but the young man, when he heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. He went away grieving. Why? I believe he hadn't realized yet that he had failed in his own. He probably was more willing to walk a hundred miles if Jesus had told him that, or, or say a hundred prayers if Jesus had told him that, wasn't he? He was looking for something that he could do He should have said, Master, you're the only one who has done all these things. I need to believe in you alone, but he didn't. Now drop down to 26 in closing. Jesus' disciples in the verses in between were a bit puzzled because they 
had also been thinking that, that uh, they could somehow work their way to heaven or, or at least the rich man had a chance because the rich man had lots of money he could give to the poor, he could put lots of money in the offerings, so that helped, didn't it? What does Jesus say? He says, and this is my paraphrase again, it's impossible for human beings to inherit the kingdom, but it's only possible with God, for no keeping of the laws will help you. It cannot be by works, but only by the grace of God through believing in me. Friends, that's what it means to be justified by faith, or through faith. And I was just thinking, if there's someone here listening today who's something maybe like this young man, that's still looking for something to do, forget about it. Because it's not going to work. It's not going to get you there. God will not accept you on the basis of what you've done. He only accepts us and he only credits us with his righteousness when we believe in Jesus Christ. We have to believe that it's been done already. Jesus paid the price, didn't he? Believe him if you haven't already. And God will gift you his righteousness. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Pray that this will cement itself into our thinking. And if there is someone here that has not yet made that decision to believe, we just pray that you'll just stir their hearts this morning and to believe in you as having finished the work that you set out to do by dying on the cross and saving us. Thank you so much, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.